Okay, are we all back again? Okay, hello. Um, my name is Georg Eckes uh, from this institute, from the German Film Institute. Um, I've been uh, managing a project that was called EFG 1914. And um, it is not really an educational project and it is also not a rights project um, but um, it uh, touches on both issues I think um, on the rights rather obviously because we digitize films and make them available online um, and uh, it is also um, it has also implications for education in a very broad sense actually uh, because by doing that, we open up um, uh, quite um, a rather big um, amount of, of, of films, of, of content, of historical sources, actually, um, that could possibly also be used for education. And um, for me, these, this workshop today was, was quite good, actually, because um, having presented that project also on a couple of occasions with um, education professionals, um, not not exactly from the film domain, but rather general uh, um, history teachers and stuff like that, um, and being asked, like, am I allowed to show this in the classroom? Um, I was all always struggling to give an answer. Uh, and um, I was just, like, thinking that maybe I simply haven't gotten it or maybe I'm not well informed enough and stuff like that but today I find out that is not the case obviously so uh, that was that was quite good for me today uh, to actually have um, a professional and a lawyer um, here uh, telling me that he also doesn't know basically so um, uh, that comforts me in a way and uh, well, um, since we are in uh, a cinema, I thought it was good to maybe show a film. Um, and, uh, so I'm starting with um, one. I actually brought three films. Um, maybe I'm only showing two. I have three films. Uh, two of them are um, short and nice, and one of them is long and ugly. And um, the two short and nice films are French films, and the long and ugly film is a German film. Um, and um, uh, I'm showing you the first one, which is a French film from um, 1914, uh, essentially. It comes from the Belgian Film Archive, from the Cin Cinematheque. Um, it is actually in the public domain, um, and it was digitized in that project. Um, pardon? <laughs> um, and before I started, it's really short, actually. Um, it's uh, an, an actuality, a, a piece of a newsreel of the time, actually, um, um, uh, which um, features Franz Ferdinand. Um, and um, uh, you really need to pay attention, actually, to, to see him and to catch him. Um, please pay attention to the person taking from the back, actually, taking the flowers. You will see what I mean when I start that. That's him. So um, this is actually um, going back to the issue of um, 
uh, why is that important for education? Um, this is, for example, where you can, can show an audience, a young audience also, um, how um, the outbreak of the war um, in 1914 14, was actually covered um, because Obviously, um, at that time, the assassination itself, it was not shot on film. Um, so the, the um, people, the, the distributors and the cinema owners who needed to satisfy that information need, actually, of the, of the audience, struggled to, 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 to find out, yeah, how, how can I satisfy that need of the people who want to see who's been assassinated, what's going on there, actually. So obviously they did basically the same thing as people from um, uh, news broadcasters and so on do today. They went into the archive um, and uh, uh, searched for footage. I think that footage is not from 1914, it's from 1910 or 12, something like that. Um, and uh, they re-edited it and um, uh, brought it as a newsreel, basically. So mechanisms of um, uh, satisfying the, the information need of audiences and, uh, and seeing what was the um, uh, horizon, the knowledge horizon of the population at the time, actually. Um, questions like these can be addressed with content uh, that we digitized basically in that project. And that, I think, is valuable, valuable um, not only for researchers, but also for teachers. Um, so what did we do? Uh, it's a project that has already ended. Um, it ended in uh, 2014. Um, it was a project um, of 26 film archives, basically, digitizing and making available about 3,000 titles, um, which is, an, is equivalent of about 700 hours of film. Um, and uh, we also digitized uh, 5,600 film-related objects, which are like posters and, and uh, things like that, um, with the purpose of um, primarily publishing that online on the European Film Gateway and on Europeana. Um, it, the whole project uh, was rather big, actually, as you can see. Um, it had a total budget of about 4 million euro, and half of that came from the European Union. So um, before touching on some rights issues, I will do that in the end. Um, I just want to give you an impression of what we were doing basically in that project. Um, so all that work actually starts on the upper left side of this slide, actually with the title selection, obviously, people going into the archive, selecting the titles. Um, when that is done, um, uh, actually doing the physical selection, seeing what is the best real to digitize, um, do the physical selection um, of the best reference copy, um, then um, prepare and clean that best reference copy, um, basically scan that in a, in a, in a scanner. Um, then you have a digital master. Um, that digital master you normally can't show on a regular computer, for example, um, because first you need to encode it. Um, uh, so that was also done in that project. Um, by encoding, you get the distribution files um, that are put on a, on a server locally by the respective archives, not centrally here, um, and then shown on um, EFG and on Europeana and also in a, in a small virtual exhibition that we did in the project. About rights, um, normally, um, you would go like um, research the rights, get all the licenses that you need, that permissions and so on um, in work package one on the upper left side before you do anything else. Because uh, doing anything else, if you don't have the permission to do to digitize and make available, would be pointless, would be a waste of resources. Um, but what I can show you, uh, what you will see a little afterwards, that is that this is not realistic. This is not a realistic approach. Um, because um, finding rights holders, negotiating with rights holders, getting an agreement, getting a license agreement signed actually takes time. Time that you don't have in a project like that. We had two years. If we stopped everything before we have uh, a signed license agreement in work package one, then the project would have taken not two years, but four or five or six years probably. 
So this is the so these are actually some of the films uh, that we actually used here. Some of them, um, I, I I admit I took the ones in bad condition because that looks nice. And uh, some of them were in rather bad condition and, and needed some care before digitizing. Um, but most of them were, were in better conditions, uh, other than, admittedly, than, than those here. Um, when you've digitized a film, um, it, it looks like this. Um, this is a digitized film, basically. It's uh, a DPX files, um, like uh, uh, you have uh, in, in that folder, like 12,800 DPX files. Every file is one frame, and this is the stuff you need to encode to view it actually properly. And this is how it looks on uh, the European Film Gateway uh, when it's uh, published there. Um, and this is uh, actually the film um, that I've shown you just right now. Also on that project, obviously, we um, uh, where where that that was not available, we did um, keywording, we um, did content descriptions and stuff like that. Though, so you can can actually find it when you when you search something online, and um, uh, a little bit in into the question of uh, uh, what what did we actually digitize and what can you find there actually. You can see that most of the films come from um, the from Great Britain, basically. Um, this is uh, partially because the Imperial War Museum was one of the partners. Is it is one of the biggest film archives. It probably has the biggest World War One related collection in the world. Um, and um, it, there is in the UK there is something like the Crown copyright, um, and uh, the um, Imperial War Museum actually owns the copyright um, to most of the of, of their films, basically. Um, so it was uh, quite uh, e not easily, but it was possible for them to um, give access to that online. Um, so you can see many from France and Germany and Italy, and so on. Um, this is a first in a uh, couple of slides with pie charts because I like pie charts. Um, these films were mainly um, from, like, um, as you can see, from 1918, and this is quite interesting uh, because you this, in in my opinion, this reflects also a little bit of the the actual film production related to to the First World War, because filming the war. Um, in 1914 and 1915 was very difficult and often prohibited actually by um, military censorship and so on um, and only like starting in 1916 um, it was more um, it became more frequent that authorities actually used film um, for information and propaganda purposes. Obviously, the, the famous Battle of the Somme film uh, you uh, you know about probably uh, was a, a kind of a, a, a start of that that provoked uh, a German answer um, of uh, uh, by unseren Helden an der Somme is the German answer to Battle of the Somme. And this actually um, uh, was also in Germany, for example, the start of a big um, war-related film production. And um, so, but we did not only cover and select films here from the war itself, but also from before the war, like um, uh, films and images from the Balkan Wars, for example, and afterwards, um, in, like in the 1920s, when the topic of World War I was often very frequently a, a, a topic of film production of feature films and so on. So, as I said, it's not all documentary, but mainly um, most of them, like three quarters of all those films are documentary or, or newsreels. Um, only 19% are fiction films. Most of them are rather short, like um, uh, just just um, a one reeler, basically, um, of uh, 15 minutes or less. What we did, for example, publishing that online it to, was also to, to, um, uh, to make a couple of categories to, to easily navigate and find um, 
the films, those uh, 3,000 films um, that, uh, uh, that are now available online. And um, this is a thing um, I found useful and um, uh, I heard that users found useful actually to, um, to get a be better picture actually of what is there um, up from Western Front and Eastern Front up to animals actually. Um, these are the three films that I brought. The first one I showed you already. Um, if you have the time before I go into a couple of rights questions, um, I would show you the second one, which is from the iFilm Institute in Amsterdam, um, and uh, uh, which is called uh, Dans les agents du Vada, um, which is like in the Vada Delta. Um, and um, this is especially um, attractive, uh, I think, um, because of uh, the uh, the colorization, the particle with the uh, particular method, and um, I'm quickly zooming out of the presentation for this and start that film. Wait a moment. This film is from um, a little later, from 1916, I think. Um, and uh, it falls also a little bit under the, the um, uh, category, I think, of um, uh, how to communicate war and war efforts to the audience. Because after the initial stages of the war in 1914, um, people rather quickly got fed up with um, cinema audiences uh, rather quickly got fed up uh, with um, all the same images that that said nothing um, there was no nothing no battles going on because the cameras were very big and and and, and heavy and um, it wasn't allowed to um, uh, to, to, to shoot films near the front anyway, and anyway it was too dangerous to do that and not very common, so all the images of the war that the people saw in the cinemas were rather boring actually, so they turned away and they actually complained um, about the, the quality of war related films that were published in the, in the cinemas and um, I think you can see in, in this film also an effort to make it more attractive again for an audience to, to, to see that and um, obviously the colorization plays a part in that. And um, obviously it is, it is also a part of the, uh, of, the, of the visual attractions connected to the war that um, in the cinema people could see places where they never had been and which they never had seen before actually. And um, this was um, not only uh, about informing about the war and um, and, uh, uh, and 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 getting information about about the war and so on, but it was also about um, seeing interesting places actually where the war in that case took place, and um, uh, this is quite an obvious example I think of that. It's a French uh, troop um, that uh, puts a puts up um, a machine gun post um, on uh, in that river delta actually uh, near Thess Thessaloniki um, and um, uh, and that's basically it it's not much more not, not much more story around that
not to see it. Almost. Yeah. yeah. So, um... Rights issues. Um, as I said, rights were... And, and um, finding out about rights and um, orphan works and stuff like that was really not at the, at the heart of the project. Um, but... Um, Obviously, we um, do, doing all of that, we found out a little bit. Um, and um, so that's basically what we found out about those titles, um, digitized and um, published online, that 71% uh, were in copyright, um, that 17% had no known copyright or were presumed orphan, um, and 12% were pretty safely in the public domain. And um, so um, this matches, I think, quite well the, the um, estimates uh, done uh, four, year, four years earlier by, by ACE, I think. Um, and, um, uh, but, but still, um, it's not, you have to, you have to see in, the, in that pie chart, actually, um, it's not possible really to go back in time far enough to um, to get around the copyright issue, it's not possible for film uh, because um, uh, these are, as I as I said, like films from the nineteen tens mainly, um, and still seventy one percent are in copyright uh, as far as we could see. Um, so you need to deal with that. So um, how did we do that? Um, through uh, in most of the cases, individual negotiations with rights owners. Um, contacting them, um, writing emails, calling them, um, having a draft uh, agreement. This is one of the, the agreements um, from um, my institute, from the German Film Institute. This is basically a license agreement, um, which is very, we, we try to keep it very, very simple. Um, and this worked in most of the cases, I, uh, I can say. Um, like in definitely more than 90 or 95% of the cases, it, it worked rather smoothly, I, I think, um, although it was time consuming. Um, but it only worked rather smoothly because we had something important to offer um, to the rights holders. This was the digitization of the film. Um, if we were not, had not supplied like the public funding for the digitization of the film, this would, all that negotiation would have gone entirely different. And um, so um, that is the thing here. Als Gegenleistung für die Lizenz erhält der Lizenzgeber Zugang zum Digitalisat zur uneingeschränkten eigenen Verwendung. That means um, uh, the rights owner gets access to the, uh, to the digital copy of the film for his own use, basically. Um, and in return, we get the permission to publish it online. That worked in, as I said, in most of the cases, because that is really attractive for a rights owner. Um, and, um, uh, but even that didn't work in all of the cases. Here's an example where it didn't work, for example. This is um, an answer uh, from a lawyer of a script, uh, uh, the lawyer of a, um, granddaughter of a script writer of a film of 1919. Um, and uh, this is the answer where well, it's like, okay, everything is fine. Um, um, as long as we get a share of 25% um, for with the um, exploitation in cinema and distribution, um, uh, you are allowed to digitize that, no problem at all. Um, but for publishing it online, um, that's the quote. It's like um, 2,000 euros. And um, 1,000 euros for, the, for um, the, the granddaughter, for the heir, and 500 euros, obviously, for the lawyer, I think. Um, so, uh, and this was, obviously, in that case, a killer. This, this film is digitized. Um, it sits here, but it's not available online because we didn't want, we couldn't, and we didn't want to pay that. And um, so going back to what I said, said earlier, 
obviously that film we shouldn't have digitized at all. Um, but you have a contract with a um, with a with a lab with a facility that does it for us. You need to do it within like six weeks. Um, you don't have the time to wait for the answer. So we digitized it, hoping that we get permission. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Bad luck. So um, that's the risk that you you really have to take in those these kinds of projects. So um, yeah, that's. That was my two cents, and uh, thanks a lot. And um, any questions? The proportion of individual right, rights yeah, owners? Yeah, like, like the example you just gave now. Um, luckily, not that big. Um, so um, it's not like 3,000 emails times five or something like that, no. Um, uh, luckily, many of the films are um, uh, with um, big rights holders. In Germany, for example, the Monau Foundation or the Federal Archives. So in these cases, like um, a quite high percentage um, of films could be um, solved by just having those two contracts basically that needed to be negotiated, um, but not all. I don't have the quote, um, I have to say, but yeah. And have you got some films about uh, what arrives in Russia? Uh, Russia. In Russia? Yeah. Yeah, I think there are like the, um, especially the Austrian Film Museum, which was also a partner, provided some films um, like the Kino Nedelia. Um, and, uh, but we didn't have a Russian partner, actually. That was uh, an issue um, because uh, it was a European project. Only EU institutions in EU member states could receive funding. So Russia was out of that. So do you know if teachers actually used uh, some of these materials because you said that you had contact with the uh, history teachers and etc. Um, we didn't do a proper survey of that yet. Um, this is something I would really like to do. Um, and I uh, only know from a few occasions where teachers actually use that uh, in, in schools. Um, I know of quite many uh, occasions in universities actually uh, where in seminars and so on where uh, professors uh, are using that uh, portal and and the, the films and that's that happens quite quite often and we also have this school cinema program uh, the school cinema yeah. program we also had so we did a, pro a program for the what's it called in english Oh, that's right. Yeah. Just to add some um, an answer, we started an um, educational program on ba on using those films uh, um, two years ago, and it will end in nine, in 2019 at the end of the war, uh, because there was um, I'm not going into the details, but uh, some money um, given by the region of Brussels to just talk about uh, the impact of war in Belgium and in Brussels, and because the impact was uh, not so not so big in the French part than in the Dutch part of the, the country. And so far we have like 10 to 15 workshops a year uh, and we change the topic every year. So last year it was about filming the war, filmer la guerre, and this year it's about the end of um, the Belle Époque, to know to, you know, the switch of representations at the end of the... And it's uh, surprisingly, it's increasing. <laughs> It started very difficult. I mean, it's not easy to 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 sell it to the school, but uh, now it's uh, so. I hope next year will be, and uh, next year the the team will be the what's what is happening um, in the back, uh, dans derrière les lignes. So not in the front line, but in the back. You know. Mm -hmm. 
countryside on them. <laughs> do you do that? Do you use online sources or do you do that through um, DVDs and stuff? Uh, no, we we do it in the in the archive. So the classes come to the archive, but um, so we use mainly our films. But of course, you we also use sometimes. Uh, movies about Germany and of, of other countries, of course, because we cannot focus only uh, on uh, Belgian filmmakers. There are not so many, in fact, we're mostly French <laughs> making films in Belgium, uh, Alfred Machin and so on. But, yeah. Uh, we just want to know if it's possible to download the, the films because uh, in school there is no really internet connection. So. No. Um, well, yes, but no. Okay. <laughs> um, as as any film online, um, uh, even if you don't provide a download function, there are ways to download it. And, yeah, of um, uh, but it's against the terms of use of okay. the portal. Okay. But that's that's what what teachers have been telling me. Like, um, they don't want a link when when you are in front of like uh, thirty r raving children actually, um, and want to to sh to do something in 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 a class, you don't want to link that may not work or work slowly or do not do the thing that you need that it needs to do. Maybe um, you need you you want to be sure, and p teachers can be sure when they have a DVD or a physical copy they show it. Um, so uh, this this is an issue. A platform that um, authorized download, but for uh, you know, like just one two days, and um, so. But it's also if you know a little about computer, you know, is, there is hidden files, so you can. But they are not supposed to know that. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was it, right? Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs>